Hey, I want to say this one thing. I'm going to invite some really good friends of mine up here in a second, but I want to say one thing about fasting. We're two weeks into fasting. Two weeks into fasting. We have, from today, we have one more week to fast. Now, how many of you had a headache that you were fasting and you had a headache? Anybody have a headache? Anybody feel weak and tired when you're fasting? Oh, just, just me. So I was thinking about this this week. Jack and I were talking about this last night. Fasting reveals where we're weak. That, that's what it's designed to do. And so I need you to understand something because I, 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 I thought about fasting the wrong way when I first started doing it. I thought, man, if I fast and pray, God's going to show up with this and he's going to kill all my enemies. <laughs> yep. Yep. Did you, did you pray that this last week? Lord, just kill him. I mean, I'm fasting. I'm fasting, Lord, believing in you. Um, take care of, like, like, do something with my kids. Like, like, we're just fasting. We're believing God for the crazy. That's what we're doing, right? But I need you to understand something. When Jesus fasted 40 days in the wilderness, the devil didn't tempt him till the end. Because at the end, he was the weakest. At the end, he hadn't eaten for 40 days. He had been out in the wilderness, and it said he was tired and hungry. And guess who showed up? The devil. So here's what I've been thinking about this time. Fasting is revealing in me where I am weak. Because guess what? When I don't eat what I like to eat, you might think I get more spiritual, but I end up getting ignorant. <laughs> and what I figured out was when I don't get steak and all those other things that I like, I start being on edge a little bit. You say, oh, no, 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 we're praying. Yeah, even with prayer. So what happens is when you deny yourself, it's starting to reveal where the weakness is in you. That's the beautiful thing about fasting. And when we reveal, when God reveals the weakness in us through fasting, then we make room for him to fix it. Amen. We make room for him to empower us because when we fast and pray, guess what? You end up being tempted when you're weak. That's, that's a biblical, that's what happened with Jesus. And so I just want to encourage you this week. If you're like, man, I started fasting and all hell broke loose. Listen, normal stuff happens when you fast. And the key is, is that you're a weaker body state often when you're fasting because you're not eating as much and it's just not good. I don't care what anybody says. But here's the point. God has the opportunity then to come in because we've We've emptied ourselves because remember what the Apostle Paul said, when I am weak, then he is made strong. Amen? So that's what we're doing on purpose during the fast. So we got one more week. So if you're thinking, oh, I don't know, it's just, I'm, I'm so, you're in the right spot. You're in the right spot. Don't quit. And God will empower you in your weakness. Amen? That's what I'm trusting because spinach is just not, is not, is not doing it. I'm like, Lord, I need your strength. Amen. Hey, listen, I got a reminder on Facebook the other day that in 2019 was the first time you guys showed up in Hedgesville. And uh, we were at the school, actually, uh, because we were building this auditorium. So that is, uh, this is a five years, five years that Jack and Sheila Harper of Save One have been coming. And um, listen, they're just special people. They've become good friends of ours. They live not too far from uh, our oldest daughter or our oldest daughter doesn't live too far from them. They were there first. Um, and, and we just love when they're here and they're doing a ministry all over the world that is so unique uh, in reaching so many people and helping so many people. I'm gonna let them explain it to you because they do a better job than me, but they, they are, are doing it in a way that nobody else is doing it. And I'm so proud to call them my friends. And uh, so could you give a warm Hedgesville, Berkeley Springs, Concord, New Hampshire, welcome to Jack and Sheila Harper. So who else is not gonna cross Pastor Chris while he's fasting? <laughs> That's what I got. Like, I, I'm not going to become his enemy. That's for sure. I love that guy. And I love yes, this church. Absolutely. We got a tour last night. And the minute we walked in, it was like, oh, 
oh, it was so familiar to me, and I loved it. I loved being here, and I loved walking in and seeing all that you guys. We got to go up to Berkeley Springs and see that yes, transformation up that. there. That you guys are awesome. doing it. I love it. Loved it. Love it. But yes, thank you and welcome. Thank you for welcoming us always yeah. with such open arms. And we see so many familiar faces. And I told somebody it feels like we're coming home. And so thank you for making us feel like that every single year. And yes. I cannot believe we've been here five years. I know. That's that incredible. first time that you contacted Linda. Yes. And Linda said, hey, pastor, <laughs> yeah. could you do this for us? And he reluctantly, I know, said, sure, we'll invite some people in we've never heard of and let them talk. Yeah, that's, that's great. Right. That's Church Growth 101 right there. So thank you for thank trusting you. us. Yeah, thank and you. And since then, our ministry has become a chapter here at yep. Hope Community Church. And I love that. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I have some notes here that I don't want to leave anything out. You guys are one of our strong chapters doing an incredible work right here in this community. It is rare that a church will be so vocal about the abortion issue and, and fight for life the way you guys do. We just came from the March for Life in Washington, D.C. Did anybody hear all the news about it in the media? Oh, no? Really? <laughs> oh, some of you did. That's great. They don't tend to uh, advertise this very well, but I'm here to tell you there were hundreds of thousands of people there in the mall marching. We stood on the sidewalk for 20 minutes waiting on our friends to come by, and they had not even moved out of the mall yet. That's, I mean, that just gives you an idea. Hundreds of thousands of marchers, even though it was freezing. Like I could not feel an appendage at one point. It was so cold. We're not used to these temperatures like you guys are. Like our coats are for decoration. They're not for warmth. And so I had this little coat on thinking I'm going to stay warm. And so we're out there and I, I was brought to tears because I was like, these people are not going to be deterred. It, it, it rose, it, it uh, emboldened me, like yeah. made my faith even more to see everybody out there that's like-minded. And even though, you know, it, we have so much against us when we're fighting for life, these people were not going to be deterred. Even though the wind chill was 25 degrees, ice and snow everywhere, it was incredible. And that's what you guys are a part of. It made me so happy to see those people out there marching, and I absolutely loved it. We come together at this time every year to celebrate now that Roe has been overturned. Yes, yes. And, and even though... It, the, you know, this issue has gone back to the states and we're fighting it on a state level. We're also fighting it through the internet with abortion pills that you can just order right off the internet. And so we're fighting it in a new way, but I feel like those numbers of people that were out there just sent a message to the government saying, we're not going away, we're not backing down. In fact, we're growing in numbers and adding to the army of truth tellers that are no longer willing to be silent. Yep. And that's what you guys are doing by having a chapter of Save One here. And I just want to thank you. <laughs> thank you for doing this work. Thank you for fighting for life. It's worth it. And I believe that God smiles on any church who stands for life. Right. So thank you for doing yes. that. Yes, yes. You're going to find, find your notes now? Oh, no, you go ahead. That you go ahead. That's all of it. That's great. All right. <laughs> So uh, when I talked to Pastor Chris a couple of weeks ago, he told me that you guys are doing a series, you're fasting, and then you're doing a series on listening to that whisper, right? And so uh, Sheila and I, for a long time, have had this one biblical character, this guy that we could just hold up and we could look at him and we would say, this is the biggest, boldest, baddest guy that you would ever imagine because of his humility and his obedience. Yes. And that's Ananias. I don't know if you guys know the story, but we're gonna kind of read through it just to give you a little bit of background, backstory on it. Saul of Tarsus, he's been uh, putting people in jail for being Christians. He has been um, murdering people. He's been, he's been killing them. And he is on the road to Damascus and 
he has an encounter with Jesus, okay? He has an encounter with the Lord, a transformational encounter. He didn't just sign a card, not show back up, okay? He had one of those moments with God that, that changes everything. And so in that, in that change, he, um, to, to tame him a little bit, I guess is the way to say it, he, it, the Lord made him blind for three days. And this is what happened during those three days. So, let's see. Where is verse 10? There you go. Now, there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. The thing about that is for us to respond to that whisper, to respond to that voice, we have to know that voice, right? We have to know who that is that's, that's speaking. Like, if I'm in another room and I hear Sheila say, Jack, I know it's Sheila, right? Because I'm familiar with her. I've been with her. I'm, I, I understand her. We've cultivated a relationship. She has different Jacks. You know, she has the Jack where I'm in trouble, and I know that, I know that sound. <laughs> She has the jack where she needs something, and then I, I'm like walking in there like, all right, I'm solving the problem, you know. So anyway, he responds, the, the Ananias responds, the Lord is speaking, and this is Ananias' whisper moment right here. This is, this is it. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to a street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for the one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Obviously, Ananias knew God's voice. He spent some time with him. He's cultivated that relationship. He's, follow, he's trusted that voice. He knew the voice. He trusted the voice. And now he's following that voice. And, and that was the it wasn't the first time that Ananias has had this conversation or had a conversation with God. So he's, he's like in tune with him already. And I believe why he heard so easily and followed so trustingly is because he knew God and he knew God's nature. He knew God's uh, purpose. He knew he understood that God was always for him, not against him. Right. So just like Ananias, we we can talk with God. We can talk to him now, especially during a fast. I understand what Pastor Chris was talking about. Listen, my first three days of a fast, it, it's like I just, I just prophetically declare I'm going to be miserable, okay? <laughs> I, I, I know that I, I, don't like, I don't like submitting. I don't do submitting food. I don't like the, how it makes me feel. I mean, I'm just giving you all the best example of, of prayer and fasting right here. <laughs> but here's the thing. I know day four is coming. And day four is when my body has adjusted to not eating the things that I desire. Day four is the day that things start to clear, the fog starts to lift, the headache starts to leave, and there is an opportunity for me to get rid of my junk, as you were talking about, get rid of my junk and start to hear the Lord very clearly. And so you guys, you, some of you guys, if you started 14 days ago, you got one week left and on 21 days, you've, you've passed all that, man. You, you're sailing now, you're, you're, you're going. Some, some of you guys may not have cleared that yet. You know, maybe you started late, whatever. Just don't give up on it because fasting is one of those times that is that intimacy with the Lord, it cultivates the relationship and cultivating that relationship is, is, all, is what it's all about. So I can just tell you uh, Ananias' assignment there to go, to go and, and to be with Paul or Saul of Tarsus as he's known at that point, that's not an easy assignment. I mean, that, that's, a tough, that's a tough place. It's all, it, it, not every assignment that we get is, you know, the best location and, and full of easy pathways and donors handing out money to, to take care of all of it. Sometimes we just don't, we can't even fathom what it's going to be because we don't know the end of the story yet. But God has a good end of the story for us. So it's overwhelmingly, maybe it's not safe, but I can tell you this, it's sound. It's good to go. Always. 
And sometimes I wish, and I don't know if you guys have ever thought about this, I wish the Bible read like an Ernest Hemingway novel, you know? Like, I want to know at this moment, like, what was he thinking? How was he feeling? Who was talking to him? Did he cry? Was he sad? Was he angry? You know, I have all of these questions, but the Bible just tells us the facts. And so we have to think about Ananias in this moment as a human being, not as this Bible character that we're reading about and we know the end of the story. But what was he thinking in the moment? He had a hard assignment. This to me kind of seems like the same thing, maybe not on the the complete same level, but like asking a Jew to go pray for Hitler. Like this is that moment. Like he doesn't know what his life, what's going to happen to his life. He knows who this guy is that this is a guy that has sanctioned murder for probably some of the people that he knew or some of the people or his friends that are in his circle are in prison because of this guy. And now he's being asked to go pray for him so he can get better? Like, really? I know I would be responding in a, you know, like I would, I would probably be responding a lot like Ananias did in this next scripture in verse 13. It says, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. And so it's kind of like, you know, don't we sometimes feel like we need to explain, (laughs) you know, like I would be doing that like God, uh, but don't you know who he is? Like, do you know what he's been doing? Do you, did you see what's been happening down here? I would be wanting to argue and explain. And it's like, Ananias just takes a minute to make sure, like, you remember who this guy is? You really want me to go pray for him? He's kind of asking that. And even though his very life could be in danger, you know, that's a lot. That's a hard assignment. And the Holy Spirit is saying you need to go. And so uh, verse 15, it says, after all of Ananias is explaining, it says, but the Lord said to him, go. <laughs> okay, go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So God didn't tell Ananias that he was going to be safe. You know, a lot of times when we hear that whisper from the Holy Spirit, we know it's the Holy Spirit. And we may go to family or friends or whatever and say, this is what the Holy Spirit told me to do. And sometimes they will derail what you've been told. So be careful who you talk to, who you trust that with, because sometimes they will derail it out of love and concern for you. But they may say things like, God wouldn't call you to do that. Your life may be at risk. God wouldn't put you in danger like that. That's not his will. Or, or it would say, that's too, too financially risky for you to do, make that move. You, God wouldn't do that. And so you start thinking and doubting what you heard. And I'm not saying you don't, you don't trust people or tell your family or anything like that, but I'm just saying beware of who you trust those things to because they could be dream killers out of love and concern for you. But really, there's no precedent in the Bible that God is stay, saying he's working to keep us safe. <laughs> I mean, you can look at the disciples' lives and see that they followed him, but it was worth it all the way to their death. It was worth it. And I'm not saying like, you know, if you follow the Holy Spirit, everybody's going to die. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the risk is worth it. When the Holy Spirit tells you what to do, you've got to know that voice, trust that voice, and then follow that voice with everything that you have. Uh, it, refi- it requires great faith in the face sometimes of possible adversity, yeah. but we still have to walk it out. Yeah. So um, Sheila and I have this friend, his, his name's Jeff, and we have known Jeff as long, actually even before I got saved in 1998. Jeff had it all going. He was an engineer. He had a, an incredible job. 
incredible house. He had wife, two girls, two, two, uh, two kids, two girls. They, they, they just had that perfect family going. Serving in the church, didn't matter what was going on. Jeff was always around somewhere, always had an encouraging word, a hard word if you needed it. I mean, he was just going. And then he got the whisper. Jeff moved to Africa. Sometimes we have to lay down all of those comforts, all those great things that are going on to do what God's asked us to do. You know why Jeff did that? It's because he knew the voice, he trusted the voice, and he was willing to follow the voice. So he goes to Africa, listen to this now, stays a year. He gets immersed in the culture. He starts to understand. He moved his whole family. Whole family, wife, kids, everybody's over there. And um, he gets immersed in the culture. He starts to understand how to do business there. He starts to understand how to do construction there. He, he makes these contacts. And then he moves back to, to Nashville. When he moves back to Nashville, he becomes the missions pastor at this church that we're going to, which is a huge, huge church. The church has a vision that Jeff is to carry out. The, 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 the lead pastor has a vision to plant 2,000 churches in 10 years, 2,000 in 10 years. And what does Jeff do? He takes all of that that God prepared him with, with that whisper, and he goes and starts this next whisper, this next thing that God's calling him to do. And I can tell you this, they accomplished 2,000 churches in 10 years. What an amazing accomplishment. So he's on staff at this amazing church. And then all of a sudden he has another whisper. This whisper is for him to start his own nonprofit and to reach unreached people groups, to reach unreached people groups through water wells and building churches. Actually, they call them a community center. They put the water well at the community center. People come to get water and they also get to hear the word of God when they come. And he's doing that all over the world, all over the world. So, you know, God, God prepares you and then he takes you on this incredible journey. If we will just let him, if we let him, mm -hmm. but we have to get ourselves in the spot where we recognize that voice, that, that moment in that whisper. And, and I just thought of this this morning. There's a scripture and I think it's in Matthew. I, I, I didn't look it up, but. It, the Bible says that God will, you, that we should not, we should not, and God will not, I can tell you that, cast his pearls before swine. And you want, it, the, the true meaning of that is, is that if he has something precious that involves his people that he wants done, he's not going to set it out before you for you to turn your nose up at it. He's not going to set it out before Sheila and I for us to turn our nose up at it. So when he knows that he has something that, that, that needs to be done, that he can trust you with, that's when he gives you those assignments. Some of them are easier than others. We're not trying to scare anybody away from, from listening to the whisper because, listen, the, the outcome, just like Jeff leaving a secular job that was, that was great, the outcome is 2,000 churches planted. Who knows? I mean, like I would just want to be standing beside him when, we're, when he's at the judgment seat of Christ and he says, this is what happened because of what you've done. I just want to be standing there to see that because that's just going to overwhelm me. I mean, it's incredible. Verse 17 says, Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, talking about Saul of Tarsus at this point, it says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes, talking about Saul, some, something like scales, and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. Obedience is simple. What, an, what Ananias had to do was simple. It's not always easy, but it's always simple. Just do what God says. Ananias' uh, obedience to the hard thing that the Holy Spirit asked him to do, it released abundance. And this is the abundance that it released because Paul goes on uh, arguably, but not too arguably, to write two-thirds of the New Testament. 
And then this is what happens because of the, Paul, the, the work that Paul, that Saul who converts and becomes Paul, that's the same guy. He, there's salvations that happen. There's discipleship that happens. There's wisdom that happens. There's teachings that happen. There's mentoring and role models and, and of obedience all through the ministry that happened because Ananias was willing and obedient to go and lay his hands on him. Obedience produces abundance. And so you can rarely tell the outcome, but I can tell you, even if you don't know the whole story up front, it's worth going. So this whisper um, came to Sheila and I in 2018. And this is just part of our story. I mean, the story is long and, and some of it is, is it's not pretty. You know, we were new Christians for a while and we did some stupid stuff. But uh, the, the whisper came to us in 2018. At that point, we were, we had, we were in our 11th year of uh, a church plant that we did. And, and the whisper just said uh, that we had to leave the church that we had planted that we loved, and that we were to do save one together. Mm -hmm. That was hard. I'm just telling you, it was hard. But there's an abundance that comes with obedience. And so we had, we had years of ministry. We had year, 11 years of pastoring. And this is what happened. As we moved out and started to do Save One together, there's a unity, which is, that unity produces an anointing, and that anointing uh, breaks the yoke of bondages in people's lives. We've seen that happen. It's not because of us. It's because he does what he said he would. But then beyond that, all of the years from the time that we got saved and the ministry that we had been doing and the pastoral relationships and things that we that we built along the way, they became the foundation and the support for us doing Save One. So 2018, they, Save One had been around for 18 years. In the last five years, Save One has doubled in size in almost every metric that you have. Yeah. Almost every one. Yeah. That was good. Obeying the Holy Spirit, obeying that whisper is why that happens. It, it's, it's because we had cultivated the relationship with him. It's because he had led us as a couple. He had led us as individuals and he had led us in ministry. We knew that voice when he spoke to us. It was no denying it. The only thing that we had to do is just be obedient. And that obedience is touching the world. So, you, you, you know, it can be risky and it can be unknown, but it's worth it every time. That's right. That's right. And any of you know what we do at Save One, we help men, women, and families recover after abortion. And we do that because we feel like the people who know the truth are the ones who should be in our communities telling that truth. But you really can't, can't go tell that truth until you have found hope and healing and transformation through Jesus Christ. And where do you find that? But in the local church. And I want to tell you just a quick story about my friend Donna. She doesn't mind me telling her name because she tells the story everywhere. She's so proud of it. But years ago, she came through one of our Save One classes and she was so broken. It was, it, it was sad to even hear her story and what she went through. But when she got through the class, she graduated and felt a prompting. She got that whisper from the Holy Spirit spirit to go and tell her family what she had been through. Now, that's not part of the Save One program. I don't want you to think that if you go through Save One here at Hope, you're, we're going to say, now go tell everybody, you know, you've had an abortion. That's not part of it. She felt prompted by the Holy Spirit. She knew that voice. She trusted that voice. And she followed that voice. And she wasn't really sure why she was supposed to tell her family. But she did. She brought them all together. It was a beautiful healing night. She told them about her abortion, how God led her through forgiving herself, and how she could walk in his abundance, the, the abundant life Jesus came to give her. And so she, you know, that finished, and it was great, and her story was out in the open. Well, years later, a couple of years later, her 17-year-old daughter came to her pregnant and not married and said, I told some of my friends, and the first thing they said was, just go have an abortion. Nobody will ever have to know. And she said, but I saw what it did to you, and I knew I could never make that choice. 
And so because of Donna's obedience, not only obedience to do the hard thing, not only did she save her daughter from years of bondage after an abortion, but she actually saved the life of her own grandchild. She didn't know why she was doing that way back then, but then it all became clear to her. And so that's what you guys are accomplishing as well. And so I just want to stop for a minute and tell you thank you, because we hear so many stories like that. And I love going back to churches and just being able to look you in the eyes and say thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for making this happen, because without you, we can't go and we can't start other chapters just like what is right here at Hope. You guys have seen the transformations. You've sat in those classes and seen those men and women walk out and they're bold and they're proud and they're and they're not going to be silent anymore and it's beautiful and so you guys are what's making this happen when we first started this I had no idea that it would grow to now this is what you're a part of this is what we have done collectively it's not just me and Jack doing it we have a whole team and we have churches like you guys but now we have over 400 chapters in 28 nations around the world it's been incredible to see but what I love to see also thank you God is good he deserves all the praise but 6.4 6.4 people per day each and every day through 2023 engaged with one of our Bible studies here in America. Every single day, 6.4 people. That's over 2,300 people last year who found hope and healing through Jesus Christ in one of our chapters, just like here at Hope. And so that's what you're making happen. That is what you're a part of. And I cannot say thank you enough. When I say thank you, I feel like it's not enough to show you how grateful we are that you believe in us, that you've partnered with Save One, and you make this happen around the world. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, So listen, and uh, everybody's talked about fasting, and I have my own story about fasting. I love it. I love this. I don't love to fast, but I love this subject because I am convinced there is no quicker way to get God's attention than through fasting. In James, he says, when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. And when we take the time to sacrifice something, he sees that. It's like his, I just picture like his head whipping around and looking at you like, oh wait, he's doing this, you know? And like he notices. I feel like it is so, it's such a great, a great thing to get his attention. It is through fasting, any major decision that I have ever had to make it, save one, I made it through fasting. This logo came to me through fasting, when I was fasting one time. It has now become our unofficial logo of Save One. When we were, we were led to do Save One together, it was while we were fasting. While I was fasting, God told me we were going to go global. It's like those moments that are, they are seared into your mind. And I can remember where I was, what we were doing, and every time I was fasting. And so I encourage you, like everybody else up here has, that if you haven't participated in this corporate fast yet, and, and Pastor Chris didn't say, get up there and tell them to fast. <laughs> this is like, we want you to fast because we know how powerful it is. But if, we, if you haven't yet, start small and then work up to bigger because it's kind of like a muscle. You can't like your very first fast, you're going to do water only for 40 days. And like, no, don't do that. But start small and then the next time do something a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger. And then you'll wake up one day and you're like, wow, I can do three weeks of this or four weeks. And so anyway, I love to talk about fasting because I know how powerful it is and what it means to people. But I also want to tell you a story of how not to act out of my own life, okay? And this is a story that I have always remembered, and it is a tough story because it was it was me knowing the knowing his voice, trusting his voice, but then not following his voice. I was checking out at a local grocery store one day, and I was amazed at this young girl in front of me. 
her child was wild. Like she wasn't doing anything to keep her, her kid. Like she was knocking stuff off the, off the aisles and into the floor and, and like jamming her hands on the keypad. And like I was just looking like, why doesn't she do something? I was standing there totally judging her, okay? I'm just going to be honest. Just watching her, like, why is she not doing that? And I was getting more and more frustrated because why isn't she doing something with her kid? And so I was standing there. I just had a few items I was going to put on my debit card. I knew I had two 20s in my wallet that weren't designated for anything. It was just extra money, okay? And so I'm standing there, and I'm so enthralled watching this kid and wondering why she's not watching her kid. And then I realized, like, this is taking forever. We're checking out, you know? And so then I, I look over here at the clerk, and I'm not saying anything. I'm just thinking all these things through my head. And so I look at the clerk, and she is literally taking items out of this woman's cart or out of the, the stack and deducting it, trying to get the total down to where this girl could afford it. And so the girl has her cash out, and she's trying to pay for her groceries. And you can tell she's stressed out and she's embarrassed. And I was just standing there judging her. And the Lord said, pay for her groceries. It was something like $25. I knew I had that cash in my purse, and I started arguing with him. And I was like... No, it'll embarrass her. Why should I pay for a grocery? I've never done anything like that before. And I was going through all of this in my head while this girl, one by one, was picking things out and saying, I can do without this. I can do without this. It was taking forever. I had plenty of time. But I stood there and, and arguing with the Holy Spirit. Before I knew it, she was done. She grabbed her stuff and got out of the grocery store. She was so embarrassed. And... I, I can't even tell you the conviction that came on me <laughs> in that moment. I felt so ashamed of myself. I could have so easily just fixed her problem and, and saved her the embarrassment, and I didn't do it. And so I hurried the clerk because at that point I was like, I'd, I've got to find this girl. I've, I'm going to give her everything in my purse. I'll give her my purse if she wants my purse. <laughs> you know, I felt so bad. And so I hurried the clerk, I grabbed my stuff, and I ran outside. I was looking everywhere for her. I got in my car, I went up and down every aisle, looking in the cars to see if I could see her sitting in the car. I never saw her again. I was racked with guilt because I knew his voice, I trusted his voice, and I didn't follow his voice. <laughs> And so I came home. I mean, he had to deal with me for the next couple of days. And I was like, I'm, I, whatever comes up next, I don't care what it is. We're just going to take care of it. I don't care. If, if, if somebody has a need, we're going to do it, you know. And so I'm telling, he's like, okay, honey, whatever. And so a couple of nights later, we're literally at a dinner at this banquet thing. And we're at this big table. And, and this guy, one of our friends that we knew started saying, our business got broken into and they stole all our computers and we didn't have insurance. And I was like, oh. and the Holy Spirit said, you gonna listen now? <laughs> I knew his voice, I trusted his voice. And so the next day, Jack and I contacted him and we were like, how much is it gonna cost <laughs> to replace all your computers? Because I'd made a promise, I was not gonna miss it again. He said $3,000. It cost us $3,000. There was no way we were going to say no again, or I was going to say no again. I went so, for those groceries, though. So. <laughs> I know, baby. <laughs> I do, too. But not following the Holy Spirit can not only get very expensive, but it can be detrimental. Uh, there's no telling what could have happened, how I could have furthered the kingdom by just paying for that girl's groceries, how it would have affected her life to know that somebody cared about her, but I missed that opportunity. And it cost me a whole lot more than money. <laughs> And so that's, uh, that's just uh, how not to act. It's just as important to learn how not to act as it is how to act. That's what I was going to say. It, it, not only how not to act, but just know that, you know, we're frail people. We make mistakes sometimes, but it's not the end of the line. It might cost you a little more next time, 
but it, it's, not the, it's not the end of it. If you've been fasting and you just got home one day and you're like, you know what, I got to have me a piece of fried chicken. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. If you ate that fried chicken, get back on the fast the next day. It's not the perfect scenario, but don't just give up on it. Don't just think that it's over and you've, and you've, you've messed it up and you can't make it. We're, um, listen, I, wa- I want to I just cover a couple of things with you real quick. Saul of Tarsus has this experience on the Damascus Road here. And he had to ask, who are you? This, this, the Lord himself appeared to him, fell off the horse. He couldn't even stay on the horse or donkey, whatever he's riding it. And he had to ask, who are you? Lord? Like question mark. Lord, is that you? The one that he didn't even want to acknowledge. I had that same moment in church in 1998. I didn't want to acknowledge him. I didn't want to do that. But it's the beginning. It's, the, it's that acknowledgement is, is the beginning. And the beginning starts that knowing. And the knowing starts the trusting. And the trusting starts the following. And so if everybody in the room would just bow your head, close your eyes for just a second. If you, you know, like some of us have encountered Jesus along the way, but we really haven't established the relationship with him. And if you haven't re- established that relationship or if you've had the relationship and you just kind of backed away from it. And then here today you hear about this Jesus of second chances. You hear about this Jesus that that will pursue a, a, a person that's putting people in jail and killing them. A person that will, pers- or, or, you know, a person like myself that's a 23-year alcoholic. He hadn't given up on me. He still loved me. He was still pursuing me. If you're in here today and, and you've had it, had that relationship, and it's, you just kind of got away from it, or if you've never had it, and you want to establish today as the day you start this whole thing. Would you just slip your hand up right where you are? I'm not going to ask you to come up front. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. Just slip your hand up wherever you are in here. Just raise your hand. I see you guys. Thank you. I see you. I see you. Different parts of the room. I see you back there. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You can put your hands down. So what you're doing is you're saying, you know what, Jesus, today I want to make this right. I want this to, I want to know, I want to trust, and I want to follow. And you, the Bible just says you have to just confess and believe. And so you confess and believe by raising your hand, but I have a short prayer, and I'm just going to say it with you. I want everybody in the room to say this prayer with those guys. Listen, you're not by yourself. You're in a community here. You're in, a, you're in a, an amazing church that will walk this out with you. Everybody in the room say this. Say, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask forgiveness. God, I recognize I can't do this by myself. I need you to be my Lord and to take me by the hand and lead me home. Lord, I repent which means I'm turning away from the old things and I'm pursuing you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, guys, will you give them a hand this morning? They've established something incredible. Yep. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads one more time. I may do this again. I'm trying to hurry because we're, we're past time here. Just bow your heads, close your eyes. And this time, I'm not even going to ask anybody to raise their head or raise their hand. Abortion is such a tough issue. It's such a private issue. There's, there's so many emotions that surround it. But if you're in this room this morning and you are wounded by abortion, by the choice that was made, that you made, that somebody else forced upon you, if you've been hurt by losing a loved one, a brother, a sister, a grandchild, an aunt, an uncle, a niece, a nephew, The Lord wants you to not live in that pain. He doesn't want you to continue in that. If you've paid for somebody to have an abortion when you thought you were helping, if you have driven somebody to an abortion clinic and you feel like you 
been complicit in it and you always struggled with that choice. The Lord doesn't want you to live in that pain. And so if you're in here this morning as a, as a first step, as just a, an acknowledgement, and then I'm going to ask you if you would just reach out to the leadership here at the church. Would you just look up at me? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to stand up. I see you. I see you guys. I see you. I see you. Listen, it's more important the Lord sees you. He knows. And so I just want to pray for you. Lord, we just, we just lift up these folks this morning that have been affected by the abortion issue, whether it was choice, complicit, whether they never knew about the child, whatever it was, Lord. I just ask that you wrap your arms around them, that you embolden them to reach out for help. And then, Lord, that they would start that journey of healing. Lord, we know that you are the great healer. And that doesn't just mean physically. It means spiritually and emotionally as well. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said Amen. just one more thing. For those of you that raised your hand for salvation, that you're changing your life today, will you make sure that you fill out a card or you touch base with one of the pastors because they want to help you do this faith walk and they want to help you in, your, um, in, in, in just making sure that you're in community here. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you guys thank you. for allowing us to be here. Let's stand to our feet. I'm so thankful for people like Jack and Sheila who, who are, um, God is using their story and their choices to minister to other people, and he can do that through every single one of us. Amen? Amen? So as soon as you think you've done something that's too awful for God to use, go talk to them and, uh, and find out how God does exactly that. We all have a story that God uses, and, um, and he can use yours as well to further his kingdom and to give people peace. So Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, you have been so good to us. Thank you for the word you implanted in our hearts today, Lord. Thank you for the people that made a choice to follow you. Thank you for the people that are reaching out for help. Lord, I know that you're the great comforter. You're the healer. You're our, you're our strength, God. And I pray this week that for everyone who made a decision this morning that you would be just that. We give you praise and honor. And Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us this week through a whisper. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. We'll see you back here next week.